All right, Jonathan, what's your first question? Uh, it's in Romans chapter 5. You already there? Romans 5. Verses, I believe, thir- uh, uh, 12 through 13, focusing on 13. For until, until the law, or uh, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So my question was, before the law, there was obviously was sin. So what is it referring to here when it says sin was not imputed when there was, or imputed when there was no law? So like, yeah, 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 we understand your question. Now, what it simply means in the history of the church, history of commentators, there are certain sins which are only possible in the light of revelation. Now, if you look at the different Greek and Hebrew words for sin, one of them means trespass. That is, you step across a line that is revealed. In other words, God says, do not lie. Now, if the law has been given and you do lie, you have a double whammy, like one of those game shows. Not only did you sin by lying, but you created a new class of sin, lying against a revealed law. The sin that's talked about here is that until special revelation came, here the Torah through Moses, you could not have the sin of violating that law. So the sin of violating the law could not happen until the law came to be. Now that does not mean that it wasn't a sin before. Take bestiality, for example. Mm -hmm. Moses was told, and then he told God's people, you shall not lie with an animal like you lie with a woman. If you do, uh you're going to be put to death. Now, before that was given, do we assume that there was no sinfulness connected to bestiality? No. Because you go back to Genesis and everyone is to propagate according to their species and obviously in terms of the context, uh, Fido the dog and the owner are not supposed to mix it up. Mm -hmm. But the sin of violating the law of bestiality did not exist until that law came into existence. It is the failure to understand the class of sin that exists when you violate that which has been revealed. So there are different Greek and Hebrew words. One means simply failing to do, um, to fail to be all that God wants you to be according to the creation. So when it talks about for all have sinned and all have, actually Greek, are right now falling short. Mm -hmm. You have those who are falling short of sin We have those who are violating specific revelation. So it's simply saying that. You do not have the sin of violating revelation until the revelation comes to be. Though what the sin is talked about in the revelation may indeed in bit sin before that time. Does that make any sense to anybody? Absolutely. That's why people who read this don't understand, say, well then uh, bestiality or whatever. So unless Moses invented all of these sins, Mm -hmm. the idea that we could say, we, we could do all of these things before Moses and get away with it. No, it's not talking that. They were sin, but it's not the added dimension of the double whammy sinning against Revelation. Go ahead, Tom. Um, There is, what is it, in Genesis, something I was dealing with recently, Genesis 2, verse 19, and it states that, okay, I'll just read it. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. He brought them to man to see what he would name them. Uh, and that's where the, the point of contention was with this one individual uh, that God did not know because he's going to see what Adam's going to name them. He didn't already have that, uh, you know, grasped and his mind. And uh, 
the explanation I was given was the usage of anthropomorphic language and, and a few other things, the grammar. I was wondering if you had any insight into the original tongue or uh, otherwise. To no, you might, we understand beginning with Genesis at the earliest parts of Revelation, things are very fuzzy and things are phenomenal. That is, it looks like God said, well, I'll go down and take a look at the Tower of uh, Babel to see what's happening. I'm going to go visit Sodom and Gomorrah. Does that mean there's no omniscience? No, later scripture tells you God doesn't have to investigate, says Isaiah. He doesn't have to check something out. He knows all things. Well, how do we explain the earliest chapters? Well, because it's called the principle of progressive revelation. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God dribbled out special revelation like you build a sand castle. Uh, now your wife's going to have a child, and if you have that child, you're going to take that child to the beach here in Southern California. And that child, particularly if it's a little girl, will want you to make a fairy little castle for her. And you will dig a hole like I did for mine, and you will dip up, and you will make little sand castles. Revelation came in drips and drabs. Or another illustration that I use, you go to the Empire State Building, you put in the quarter, when you look through the binoculars, the first fuzzy. As you turn the knob, everything comes into sharp focus. We have fuzzy views of God, man, sin, salvation, all of those things are fuzzy because they're dripped and drab and it gets clearer and clearer and clearer till you come to the sharpness of the New Testament. So I begin with the assumption that we're not going to get a finished view of God in Genesis. This is why people who think the Bible is one book complain, well, why isn't the Trinity in Genesis and why is it? Well, you've got to understand this is primitive. It's just the beginning. God just beginning to reveal himself. So of course he talks like this. I'll go down and check it out. I want to see what you could do. It is phenomenal just as much as we describe the sun rising and setting. We know it's the planet moving, not the sun. Phenomenological revelation simply describes it the way that a person would look at these things. So. Uh, yeah, I have no problem with the primitive revelation, it being very fuzzy in terms of the view of God, but it gets clearer and clearer till you finally see all the omni, uh, omni attributes of God. Now, when the process people wanted to debate me, and I did debate them, they immediately run to these sections to prove that God doesn't know everything. Mm -hmm. And I said, now, before we discuss omniscience, do you believe in the omnipresence of God? They always do. The moment you deny the omnipresence of God, God explodes like a balloon. That means prayer is useless because unless he happens to be going by at the time, <clears throat> he didn't hear you. It means you've got to go to some place to get to God. If God is not omnipresent, everywhere present in the totality of his being, the gig is up, theism is dead, Christianity is a crop, and you and I might as well as go to the bar and have a good time. They all believe in the omnipresence of God. I said, now I want to make sure of that. I said, now how do you handle the verse that says, and the Lord went from here to there? Well, they end up saying, well, that's, uh, well, that's a metaphorical, it's poetic, it's anthropomorphic. I get them to commit themselves to explain what looks like phenomenological language that denies the omnipresence of God. Then we go to the omniscience of God. They have just built the scaffold. They put the noose around their neck, and good old Dr. Bob, <coughs> says, hasta la vista, baby, and I pull it. Because then I say, well, evidently, the anthropological argument is valid if you're dealing with this attribute. 
then you can't deny its validity when I'm using it on this one. Always remember in theology, try to figure out where they are all ready committing themselves to your arguments. I debated a Jehovah's Witness. He said, I want to discuss whether or not Jesus is God. It could be a Muslim. <coughs> I said, well, we won't do that first. Let's discuss what is the proof that the Father is God. How do we know that the Father's a person and how do we know that he's God? Well, I elicit out of them, well, he claims to be God. He's worshipped as God. His words are said to be the words of God. They prayed to him as God. I get all of the arguments that they use. He's a person, not an electrical force. So then I turn around and I use the same arguments with the Son. And if they say, well, that's not a valid argument, again, they built the scaffolding, put the rope, and I have the lever. You can't say these hermeneutical principles are valid here and turn around and deny them there. That